5 and continues to be our verse this week. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Would you follow along in your copy of God's Word as I read to us this morning? Mark 2, 1 through 17. Hear God's Word, please. This is speaking of Jesus. And when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them. And they came, bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, Why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Rise, take up your bed, and walk but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately packed up his bed and went out before them all so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. He went out again beside the sea, and all the crowd was coming to him, and he was teaching them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. And as he reclined at table in his house, many tax collectors and sinners were reclining with Jesus and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. And the scribes of the Pharisees, when they saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, said to his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Would you pray with us, with me? Well, Father, we are grateful for your power not only to create us, but also then to recreate us, to redeem us. And we are so thankful for Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, and the powerful good news, the excellent proclamation that your kingdom is coming, that you are advancing it, and that the gates of hell cannot and will not prevail against it. God, it is into that kingdom you still continue to call us today as your disciples, as your followers, and we ask that today you would continue leading us and teaching us, calling us to repent, calling us to believe, calling us to follow. Lord, I pray that our heart's desire would be as we ask questions of you, not that we would be critical or condemn you because you are holy, you are perfect, you are pure. You're the spotless lamb, Jesus, that was slain before the foundation of the world for us. But it will cause us, I pray, as we ask questions to be changed and transformed more and more into the image of Jesus, our Savior. God, this morning we thank you for the trials that you bring us through that 
continually break away that which we think is so important in this life and cause us to see the only good thing that we have is you. Lord, we do pray this morning for Dot's son Doug as he has a biopsy on his lung tomorrow. We pray, Father, that you would give the doctor's wisdom to know how to care for him. But Lord, above all, we ask that you would continue to guide Doug to know your mercy and your grace, to rest as we do as your children and in you and our uncertainty. Lord, we also pray this morning that you would be with Bob Bodnovich as he's gone to the hospital this morning. We pray that you'd give him wisdom and the doctors as they look at and examine his arm. Thank you for keeping him safe yesterday. Um, not having more injury. Well, Father, we pray as well that you would continue to bring comfort to us in our loss. And we thank you for those that have gone before us to be in your presence. As we come to your word, we ask, God, that you would nourish us and feed us. Thank you for your spirit living and dwelling in us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Children, uh, through the first class, I believe, of first grade, you're welcome to go out this time for Children's Church, and the older class will stay with us this morning as we celebrate together the Lord's Supper. We are in Mark, and we have been looking at the beginning of the ministry of Jesus and his cause we see in Mark 1, Verse 15, the time is fulfilled and the, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And I have been encouraging us to see this pattern before us. The pattern of repent, believe, follow. And uh, one of you asked a very good question last week that I thought I'd just take a moment to address and, and to talk more through as we think of this. Because sometimes we can think of when I, when I say things like this, the thing that God is calling us to do is to repent of as much as we know right now of ourselves. To believe as much as we know of who God is at that time. And to follow Him. What we have to recognize is we humble ourselves before Him. You and I right now do not know everything that there, we can ever know about God. I was just saying this this morning in the class with the teens in the book of Revelation. We are in Revelation 4 and 5, and we see them standing around the throne of God saying, Worthy are you, O Lord, to receive glory and our, uh, honor and power do and dominion. And the reason that we'll be able to worship him and we'll continue to worship God all throughout eternity is because they'll never come to a point where we'll have God fully understood and know everything about him. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And you and I will always stand and fall down before him in worship and say, you are worthy of glory. And so what that should look like for us as Christians is you and I will come to this point of recognizing right now what I know of God, I want to follow him. But the reality is, is that you and I don't know everything that we can know of God right now or that we will know. And so this pattern takes place of repenting of as much as I know of myself right now. You know, one of the, the craziest things that happens for us as, as, as humans is that we have this wonderful desire to just think that we're all this and, you know, our spouse should be so happy to be married to us. We're so perfect. And they, they could never have someone as perfect as us. And they look at us and go, yeah, that's what you think. I know better. Why? Because they have to put up with us. They have to be patient and kind and gracious. And we are continually being shown in our relationships our sin our remaining sin and the things that God is doing in us and through us. And so when we think of repenting and believing, we should never think of the gospel in this way. Way back then, I asked Jesus to forgive me of my sins and, and save me, and it's done and over. 
Think of it this way. If you got to the altar at your wedding and said to your spouse, okay, get ready, I'm telling you for the one and final time, I'm committed to you, and I love you. You'd go, what? No, I want to hear this daily. I want you to hold me. I want you to encourage me. I want to know of this rest and security. The same thing is taking place in our lives. And sometimes we can confuse this at this point to think that one thing that we need to understand is when you and I become a child of God, we will, as it says even in the book of Revelation, as the teens are learning, we'll persevere to the end if we're truly the children of God. There is what we call an eternal security. There is this that when God has done the work of saving us, you and I can't do anything to undo it. Think of it this way. As we come to this table this morning, the only thing that you're bringing to this table this morning is your sin. That's the only contribution that you can give to the gospel. Jesus has done everything else. That's why his body and his blood are represented here. Take, eat, eat. Be nourished. But never think of that as a process that has happened and now you don't have to worry about that. And you sit back and you, you disregard because the thing that takes place is the disciples are called in the Gospels. We see this pattern. They're called and they follow Jesus. They do, but they don't get it. Jesus for example, later on in this gospel, we'll have one of the disciples, Peter, say to him, you are the Messiah, you are the Christ, you're the anointed one, you're the one we've been looking for. And immediately Jesus begins to tell them, I'm going to be crucified. And, Je and Peter says, I don't get it. You and I don't get it all at once either. And we need to recognize this pattern of repenting, believing, of following. Well, as we continue here in Mark 2 this morning, we're going to see Jesus continuing to reveal who he is more and more. Verses 1 through 12, we're going to see Jesus not only has healed a man with an unclean spirit and set him free in Mark 1, and that he's healed many, including the mother-in-law of Simon Peter, and that he has cleansed a leper, but now he's going to take a man paralyzed and cause him to rise. And then, verses 13 through 17, we'll see that he causes another man to rise, a traitor. He's worse than an IRS tax agent, and I'm not condemning you if you work for the IRS this morning. You just have to understand April 15th is coming. And for the rest of us, that's a day of reckoning that we don't like. I hope you don't enjoy paying taxes. But that's another story, and we'll get to it. Mark 2, we see him returning to Capernaum. This is on the northwestern coast of the Sea of Galilee where Jesus' ministry has been. And though Jesus is not from Capernaum, he's from Nazareth, we see him in verse number 1 that he has come here and it's reported that he's at home. And so it seems as though he has made his home base of ministry to be in this town of Capernaum. And as they find out that he's gathered there, and they begin to gather around him in verse number 2, and there's so many of them that gather to hear him and to see him, to be healed by him, that they are pressing into the house. The house is completely full. The house is surrounded and there's no one else, nowhere else to stand. And along comes five men. Probably friends. One's laying on some sort of pallet, bed. And the other four are carrying them. And they say, we got to see Jesus. There are so many people here that these guys do the unspeakable. They climb up on the roof, and they get out their chainsaws, and they start cutting a hole. Now, that's not exactly how it happened. But can you just imagine? This is Simon Peter's home, 
and the roof as they're inside and Jesus is inside teaching them, they start hearing a noise like it's reindeer on the roof and it's not Santa Claus. And so as they're pulling and making a hole in the roof, they're going to let down their friend. What a beautiful picture. I don't know if you've ever had this opportunity, but every so often... After a funeral, there's not enough men to put down the casket into the ground. And so they'll say to me as the pastor, can you give us a hand for a moment? And I'll say, sure. I'll throw my, my Bible in the car. I'll come over and they'll give me a, a band or a rope. And we'll lower the casket down in the hole. Usually it's not like that because they got that assembly. But one time, it was in the middle of winter, slimy mud everywhere. They couldn't get down to where the hole was actually dug, and so they did it up on top. And we had to slide down the hill in our dress shoes and with ropes underneath the casket, allow this casket to go down in. That's a picture that's taking place here. Their friends on a pallet... There's the descent, if you will, into the grave. It's beautiful. And as he is being descended by his friends, Jesus is seeing this. And I want you to see in verse number five this unusual expression. Now you and I would understand, rightly so, that you do not come on the skirts of someone else's profession of faith. God does not have, as some people have said before, grandchildren. All of us must personally respond to the good news of Christ. But we see this unique expression here in verse number 5. And when Jesus saw their faith, don't worry about it. Can you imagine carrying your friend? Jesus is going to heal you. We must see the Savior King. We must get to him. They bring him, and when Jesus sees their faith as they're holding those ropes, they're lowering down their friend in the presence of Jesus. He looks at the man, and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now, I don't know about you at this point. That that's not exactly what they were ho hoping to hear. They were hoping to hear something like, you're healed. And I want you to see, it's not only just the, the five here, but it's also some of the scribes. And we ran into these scribes back in chapter 1, verse number 22, because Jesus said this, as he was, it was said of Jesus as he was teaching in the synagogues. He didn't teach like the, the scribes because he taught them as one having authority, not like the scribes. And these scribes now are on the scene here in verse number 6. And what takes place is these scribes are sitting there watching and they're questioning in their hearts why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And they're right. Remember, Jesus is from the tribe of Judah. He's not from the tribe of Levi. The only one that was human that could forgive sins would be the priest when he would come and you'd offer your sacrifice. And Jesus certainly doesn't qualify for that. And the scribes, knowing their details, certainly know that. But in addition, they recognize you're not God. Or at least we don't think that you're God. Remember I said that there's two questions that are going to be always constantly before us in this gospel. Number one is, who do you perceive yourself to be? Number two, who do you perceive God to be? Jesus is the Savior King on mission, on task. These men are asking a good question. But they're asking it from the wrong perspective. Look at verse number 8. Immediately, Jesus perceiving in his spirit that they thus questioned within themselves, said to them, don't you love how Jesus comes and he challenges us? He causes us to understand more. Why do you question these things in your hearts? 
Why is it that you in your deepest point of your inner man, of who you are, stand resolute to say that I am blaspheming God unless I am God my, myself? Which is easier to say to the paralytic? Your sins are forgiven. Or to say, rise, take up your bed, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And we see this beautiful picture as this man stands up from his pallet, packs it up, and starts heading out the door. You begin to say to yourself, there's a resurrection coming. There's more to be expected here. But I don't want you to miss what Jesus is saying. We might pass over quickly because in verse number 10, he says this, but that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. We see back in Mark 1 verse 1 that he has this title of Son of God. He is the Jesus Christ, as we've said. Jesus meaning Savior. Christ meaning the Anointed One. He's the Savior King. He is being declared in this Gospel, this good news. The Son of God has come to be the ruler of His kingdom. But I want you to see when we come to Mark 2.10 here at this point, He doesn't use the title Son of God at this point, And He uses this title Son of Man. And we might be tempted to think of it this way. We might be thinking to think of it as this title of Son of God is his royal, divine, deity title. And Son of Man is his humanity. But I want to challenge you elsewhere. If you were to take your Bibles, turn to Daniel 7. In Daniel 7, you would see this title, Son of Man, come up. Let me just set the stage for you. Daniel is in Babylon. The people of God are in exile just as they are in exile right now with the Roman Empire ruling over them. They're wanting to see God's kingdom come. God gives his people hope. He gives them encouragement. And Daniel has in his night visions, Behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man. A title... And he came to the Ancient of Days, speaking of the Father, and it was presented before him. Notice what it says, And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And so when Jesus is using this title of Son of Man, he's doing so much more than just saying something different than Son of God. What he's actually saying to them is this. The one that was promised to be this Son of Man that Daniel spoke of is now standing amongst you. And he's been given all authority. He's been given all of the kingdom of the world. It is his and his alone. And it is being announced to you that you would repent, that you would believe, that you would follow me. And so that you know that I'm the Son of Man. I could say, rise up and walk. But I've got something so much greater I'm going to do. Get up, your sins are forgiven. Aren't you glad that you're in my resurrection? It's not just a resurrection. This man will one day die again, and he did. And you and I will die if the Lord tarries. But the thing that is more important for you and for me is that we would hear these words, your sins are remembered no more, your sins are forgiven, and you're the children of God. Look at the response of the people. The house is full. As he picked up his mat, his bed, and walked out, they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. Jesus has continued showing his authority and his power. 
He has shown that over an unclean spirit. He has shown that in the rising of Peter's mother-in-law. He's shown it in the cleansing of a leper. He's shown it in his power to overcome the paralysis of this man. I think even more amazing is that Jesus comes now to a man who is a traitor. A man who has sold his soul to the Roman Empire. A man who is basically given in and said, what's the use? I will, might as well make a living from the Romans. Now in the backstory of this, this good news, this gospel is, as we've seen even last week, the good news came that Caesar Augustus was coming. And Caesar Augustus was to give to the world this peace. It's called the Pax Romana, the peace of Rome. And the peace of Rome looked like this. It paved roads so that people can move. And, and ultimately, as we see and we'll see, the gospel will take those roads and carry the gospel to the known world. And it's beautiful. And it gives a, a unified language for the gospel to go forward. But the other side of it is, is if you're on the wrong end of the sword with the Pax Romana, it kind of looks like this. If you don't bow the knee to us, we'll use our sword and cut off your head. They were all familiar with this. They would see public executions. And just so that you didn't miss them, they would take them up and put them on a tree. They would take and put them up on a, a piece of wood that would cross, and they would hang it up, and they would say, this is what we do to those who come against the Pax Romana. This is what we do to those who are the traitors. And the Jewish people are saying there's a Messiah that's going to come. There's a deliverer. There's going to be one who's going to establish his kingdom and his rule. And that's what they were looking for primarily. Jesus showed them, it's so much more than that. I've come not just to deal with the Romans. I've come to deal with your sins. I've come as the new Adam, the new son of man. And at this table sits a man that's probably heard him before. The gospel before this is named in after him because he was the one that penned it, Matthew. His name Levi is given here. And as he's sitting there by the road, he is t collecting taxes. He's essentially sold his soul to Rome. He is despised. He is an outcast. He basically is doing what is best for him. And I want you to see the beauty of this. Jesus passes by and he says to him, follow me. It's not the first time this has been said. Remember it was said to Simon and Andrew. It was said to James and John and they followed him and so does this man, Levi. He rose. Notice the word, the same word that is used before. The paralytic rises. There's a resurrection your sins are forgiven. God can also save those that are the traitors, those that have turned their back, those have, that have basically, if you could think of it this way, in despondency given up on the idea even of Messiah. Does that make sense now? And he says to this man, follow me. And he does. I don't know about you, but I hate paying taxes. That's my money. It's your money. It's not the government's money. We need to do as Jesus said, render under Caesar that which is Caesar and unto God that which is God's. But the reality is I want that to be as thin and as lean as necessary and only what is necessary. You spend your money the way that you ought to spend it and not someone else spend your money. I know I'm dabbling in politics this morning, but that's how you would feel when you saw this man sitting there going, what are you doing? You've crossed enemy lines. Have you ever thought someone was outside of the hope of the gospel? Have you ever looked at someone and said, nah, not them. There's no way. I believe I would have been one of those who would qualify. 
Jesus, as much as he has mercy on the paralytic, as much as he cleanses the leper, as much as he casts out demons, he calls the man who's the living demon, follow me. And he does. I want you to see what is very interesting here. God is using this man Levi, this man Matthew, just like James, John, Simon, and Andrew. Remember what we saw in Mark 1, what was taking place? After Jesus called them, he went to the house of Simon to fellowship with them, to have a meal with them. What takes place here in this portion of Scripture is as well. Levi has been called. Levi is the one whose sins are being forgiven. Levi is the one who's repenting and believing and following Jesus. And the same thing takes place. Just because you're an outcast of the society around us, you're a sinner, you're a tax collector, as he's going to be talked about here in a moment, I'm still going to come to your home and dine with you. I'm still going to fellowship with you. Just as I did with James, John, Simon and Andrew, and as he does, guess who shows up? All of Levi's friends. And guess what his friends are? Tax collectors and sinners. This is a wonderful story. If if you find yourself being the black sheep of society, Jesus dines with them. He is fellowshipping with them. He's feasting with them. He's reclined at the table in his house, it says in verse number 15. And again, the scribes come on the scene. Scribes come asking their questions as we do as humans. The scribes of the Pharisees now, the, the sect of the, of the people that want to live righteously and purely they're the ones who they've sent their scribes. Now can I, just for a moment, draw us to see the different groups that are in Israel at this time. There are a couple different sects of people. One are the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are people that are religious zealots. They want to do what is right. They want to live a virtuous life. They want to be a person of character. If you were to mention the name today, Pharisee, in the land of Israel, you would not get the response that you typically get in the evangelical church today of being this goody two-shoes that was on the wrong side. They would be revered and respected because they were people who wanted to obey and follow God. In fact, they wanted to obey and follow God so much that they even made secondary laws so that they would never break the laws of God. They were looking for God's kingdom to come. They really were. They knew the scriptures. Another group were the Sadducees. The Sadducees had sold their souls to a little bit and had said, okay, we're under Roman occupancy, so let's make the best of it. And they're the ones that later on do not believe in a resurrection. They don't take the scriptures like the Pharisees do. Pharisees could be thought of those literalists. The Sadducees are saying, let's make the best of both worlds. And then you have those that will come into contact soon with the Herodians. And the Herodians are basically those that are saying, hey, Herod and his rulership over Israel is pretty good, and so we'll follow him. And then you have a last group which one of Jesus' disciples will be part of, and they're the rebels, and they're called the Zealots. And they say, anything that we can do to get rid of them... Let's do it. They were the gunslingers of the day. No rule of Rome over us. And so when these scribes come, these teachers, these ones who are carrying God's word, are knowing it, studying, these are people coming from those that want to do what is right. And when the scribes of the Pharisees saw that he was eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said, who is this anointed one? Who is this Jesus? Because doesn't he know what he's doing right now? He's eating with the tax collectors. He's eating with sinners. You shouldn't do that. 
Well, I want to remind you that there's been times in the past these, these Pharisees are saying this, if you do this, you're not going to be clean. If you do this, you're not going to be right. If you do this, you're not going to be holy. If you do this, you're not going to be perfect. You're not going to be pure. And so therefore, that's why we've caused this division to happen between us because of this. And what does Jesus say? Listen, I've already touched a leper and instead of becoming unclean, he became clean like me. I've already healed. I'm showing my power to you over and over again. What does he say to them? They ask their questions. They're trying to perceive who God is. And the question they really need to be saying is, who am I? And who is this Jesus that I may follow him and surrender myself to him? And Jesus gives them that kind of an answer. And he says this, those who are well have no need of a physician. But those who are sick, I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. We're coming to this table here shortly. And we're not coming to this table because we're righteous, because of what we have done. We're coming to this table, like I said earlier, and the only thing that we're contributing to it is our sin. Jesus has taken our sin in the great exchange at the cross and bore our sin in his own body and given to us his perfect righteousness. It's a beautiful picture. Just as he came to Simon and Andrew and their house and dined with them, just as he came to Levi's house and dined with him, right now you and I are preparing to come and dine with him and to feast and fellowship. And he's not coming because you and I have it all together. It's not because you and I don't need to worry about asking these questions. What is it that I need to confess of my sins before God? See, you and I are not losing our salvation in this process, but what's taking place is, Jesus, I recognize you for more than I ever knew before, and now that I know you as who you are and who you're declaring yourself to be, I see even more of my wretchedness, of my sin, and so I, I confess it before you, that I may believe more of who you are. I want to think of it another way. Think of it this way. I'm believing less and less of myself. I'm believing more and more of you. I'm confessing my sin and confessing your salvation. I'm trusting. Who do you perceive yourself to be? Are you righteous in and of yourself? Do you see Christ, the one who has set us free from our sins? I challenge us to rise. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus is going to go to the cross that's ultimately where this good news leads. If any man follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Son of man has not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And when I do, I will rise again. And it's a beautiful picture. You too will rise with me. As we come to this table, we rise again we see the beautiful power of the gospel in us. And we have opportunity to celebrate and to feast and rejoice and to say, Jesus is in the house. I'm eating with Jesus today. He's coming to my table. I'm fellowshipping with him. Because of that, we should ask ourselves those pertinent questions. 
if you were to have a guest, a very important guest come to your house this, today, what would you say? Would you say, oh, you can't come today? The house is not perfect. Things are in disarray. We, we did not clean up before we left for church, and it's just, there's no way I'm going to let people see what it looks like right now. Same goes for us. As we come before the Lord, we have the wonderful privilege to confess our sins. And if there's anything upon our consciences that His Spirit is dealing with, the remaining sin that we have before us, I encourage us to take that and give it to Him, to confess it this morning. Repent. Believe and follow. Father, we thank you for the joy of Jesus Christ. I pray that you would continue to nourish us as your children, that Christ would grow in us and through us. And Lord, we thank you for Christ who gave himself for us. In Jesus' name, amen.